The Office for National Statistics says the UK's economy returned to growth in January. GDP rose by 0.3% compared with December, which has seen a contraction of 0.5%. What is the biggest problem with the monetary and financial system? Uh, fundamentally, the financial system has become the master of the real economy rather than its servant. It's become a very bloated, homogenous, extractive system that perpetuates inequalities, breeds instability and and undermines democracy. Uh, yes, I do think it is at the root of the ecological crisis because we have an economic system that insists upon growing and insists upon enriching the already rich. I mean, this idea that big corporations are that are going to solve our problems they can't solve our problems it's the scale that in itself that is problematic the story that capitalism would fix everything is very strong and that story is now crumbling and that's good it's good that it's crumbling but of course we have to replace it with something that is positive and that isn't just capitalism or communism again it's a failure of imagination to think that those are the only two options we have we're usually distracted by arguing about the detail in something so that we don't ask the major questions about the system as a whole. And that's why this podcast is an important one because it kind of surfaces a whole bunch of stuff which actually will, if you think about it, will make all our brains fry. Sitting comfortably, seatbelts on, we're off on another adventure in Utopia with me, David Brown. This podcast is sponsored by the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. No, really. Welcome to our sophisticated investment product, based on robust modeling of the banking system. It provides a unique opportunity to discipline the reckless bankers. Hold the investment instrument in your wallet firmly. Try using it to whack a banker. My head! Really? You won! So, we're retiring. In parting, we would like to offer our heartfelt thanks to all taxpayers for so generously funding our pensions. Artist Tim Honkin's arcade game there, Whack a Banker, found on Southwold Pier. A cathartic game in which players are given mallets and as bankers' heads pop out of different holes, you get to hit them as hard as you can. But as the banker's voice reminds us at the end, the financial game is rigged in their favour. The dictionary definition of capitalism is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. As some of this episode's guests suggested at the beginning, our economic system really isn't fit for purpose. One even said to me, if the capitalist story was presented as a myth, it would have to be a tragedy. Being a podcast in search of new narratives, we're going to delve into some of the fundamental problems with capitalism and our economy and explore other economic models with better measures and ones that might allow for a paradigm shift from the need for constant growth to something more sustainable, regulated and nurturing of life. Yet, I know it's a huge topic and one which we can only really scratch the surface of in an hour. What we do have on our side, however, are some amazing guests. First, we're going to look at the problems with economic growth, delve into the history and limitations of GDP. Then we're going to learn about donor economics from Kate Rayworth, degrowth from Timothée Parikh, human scale development from Inez Aponte, ecological business models from the Eden Project's of Tim Smith and Sarah Osterholzer, positive money from David Barnes, and we'll end with how one man, the Reverend Billy of the Church of No Shopping, is spreading the good word across the US. Kate Rayworth is an economist best known for donut economics. She succinctly summed up the problems with capitalism when she said, we have an economy that needs to grow whether or not we thrive. We need an economy that helps us thrive whether or not it grows. So what exactly is the issue with economic growth? We'll hear first from Timothée Parikh, more of him later, and then from Kate. The living world is always bounded. You always have limits. Economic growth as a discourse is one where every year, whatever happens, your economy needs to be bigger. And it's a compound growth. So next year, your economy will be 2% bigger than last year. And then 2% more, 2% more, 2% more. And so if you have just seemingly innocent rate of 3% growth per year, it means your economy is doubling 
every generation. Again, with no limits, there is no arrival point. If my friend goes to the doctor and he tells her she has a growth, that is not something that anybody celebrates. That's something we immediately act to stop and bring ourselves back to health. In the mainstream economics, and I'm going to call it 20th century economics, that I was taught and that is still taught in universities around the world, the shape of progress is a line that's rising up, 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 off the page and actually would end up going through the ceiling. It's an exponential growth curve and it measures GDP, gross domestic product or national income, how much money is made from buying and selling of goods in a, an economy in a year. And that means we have an economy that thinks growth is inherently necessarily good. Growth within our bodies is a cancer. So if we think about health in our bodies, our health lies in balance. And balance is health. And if we know that at the level of the human body, can we not now take that to the planetary body and create economies that are successful because they enable humanity and the rest of the living world to be healthy? And that is not going to be by en endlessly pursuing growth. How can we shift away from this deeply embedded system to creating economies that enable people and the rest of the living world to thrive whether or not they grow. It's an insanity to think that the only way we can improve our well-being, the only way we can stop people sleeping in doorways and queuing at food banks is to have yet more growth in the richest nations in the history of humanity. And I think it's the existential economic question of our times. How can we end our structural dependency on endless growth that has been written into our economies for over a century as if we know nothing but an upward escalator? I have 14 year old twins, right? They have grown three inches a year for just about all the past years of their life. And now I really hope for their own sake and for mine, <laughs> they stop because yeah. they're now taller than me. And if they keep growing three inches a year, they literally will not fit in the doorway. They literally cannot sit at the table. They will literally not belong in this home. And what I wish for them is not more height. It's more wisdom, more adventure, more curiosity, uh, more connection with others. It's a different kind of flourishing and thriving. Metaphors can be incredibly powerful in shaping the way that we think. As Timothée and Kate point out, growth sounds like it's a positive thing, but perhaps a more appropriate metaphor for our economy would be cancerous or degenerative. But before we get to new models, what of the measure for economic prosperity, GDP, or gross national product? Is that fit for purpose? Here's Tim Smith, founder of the Mighty Eden Project in Cornwall. We'll hear more from Tim later too. Everybody listening will probably have read or have heard of Robert Kennedy's famous speech at the University of Kansas in 1968, where he talks about GDP measuring almost everything that isn't important to humans, but it doesn't measure the quality of our public officials, the quality of our poetry, the quality of our That teachers. gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highway of carnage. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Powerful words there from Robert Kennedy in 1968. Conceived by economist Simon Kuznets in 1934 and adopted globally 10 years later, GDP is the measure of a country's total cost of goods and services over a year. Yet even its creator warned against its use, citing it as being a measure of quantity, not quality. As one economist Riley told me, if you really want to help your country with economic prosperity, you could do worse than cause a motorway pileup, get involved in a messy, expensive divorce, and have a long, complicated and expensive illness, all of which are great for GDP. If, on the other hand, you dedicated years of your life caring for someone at home, you'd contribute very little, as all unpaid work, such as household provision of care, goes unmeasured. Yet this is essential to our well-being, and so productivity is directly affected by it. Yet GDP remains the principal measure of economic prosperity globally. Here's Timothée Parik. Tim Smith and Kate Rayworth again. Every time someone in the economy produces something that can be sold at a specific price, the difference 
between the price at which you sell that thing and your cost of production will add up to GDP. But now what's interesting, imagine like a giant calculator. You only have one button and it's a plus. So you cannot subtract from GDP. So let's say people are getting depressed because they're lonely, because they never talk to the neighbors, because they have, you know, unending working weeks in bullshit jobs that they hate. So they get depressed. And so they need to go and see shrinks and then they need to have access to antidepressant. Along all this line, GDP rises because you sell more antidepressants, added value. The shrinks does more hour, added value. I think from the perspective of well-being, we would have preferred to avoid the depression in the first place. Even if that meant a reduction in GDP in the sense of like, you know what, I'm just going to work less. And instead of doing Saturdays, I'm going to spend Saturday with my kids. Or doing stuff that I like, that do not contribute to GDP, but do contribute to well-being. Same thing for ecological prevention. I mean, forest fires are fantastic for GDP. And then they use planes and they use trucks and they use a lot of fuel. So it's fantastic. So it looks like the economy is booming. But at the end of the day, you've lost a forest. The forest was not recorded in GDP because no one has produced the forest and no one is selling the forest. So that's the problem. Nature is not included in GDP. If you were to fly a plane, you know, you don't want to fly a plane with a button uh, just showing you the speed, the speedometer. You want something that shows the direction, the height, you know, you want everything. You want a dashboard to make decisions. GDP would be like driving a plane or a car just looking at the speed. It's completely stupid because you could be running towards a cliff and be like, yeah, let's just go faster because faster is always better, right? I would replace it with a dashboard, not a single number. I think we're past single numbers. And I think if the inventors of GDP were still here, like Simon Kuznets, if you were here, you'd say, oh, what are you doing with one number? Come on, that's all I had. I don't have the phenomenal range of data that's available to you in the 2020s. Create a dashboard of social and ecological metrics and you can visualize it. And I can show you the extent to which we're falling short. You know, what percentage of people don't have a decent income and what percentage of uh, kids aren't doing well in school what percentage of people aren't getting to see a doctor in time these are the metrics that matter and that actually make life work or not work are the rivers recharging farmers and communities and cities the world over need to care about that because if they're not we face drought so let's look at life in the metrics in which we actually experience it and that show us about inequalities and injustices between communities, between people, between genders and races, the things that matter. Cornwall, actually, in the UK, um, Cornwall Council have created from the donut, they've created a dashboard and you can see in red things that they say, well, actually, this is still getting worse on, on climate or some social outcomes, things that have, they say have stabilized over the last couple of years and things that have improved. And you can just look at that and there's a sort of red, orange, green. And anyone can see the complexity of what's getting better, what stayed the same, what's still getting worse. And what we've done is lazily assume that the GDP going down radically means that we're looking at economic ruin. Where accountants need to be put up against the wall and tickled to death, their whole science is based on measuring things and the measurement of cost is fine if you also have a speaker within your science or your quiver of arrows the ability to measure the cost of not doing things and the problem with gdp is it includes the costs of all the damage that are done through the actions that you're also measuring therefore you'll get all the diseases caused by consuming x y or z and you also get all the, the economic growth of all the medicines needed to mend the people who've eaten X, Y or Z, yeah. which is quite obviously madness. So we've established that an economy established on compound growth is madness and that GDP needs replacing with more complex measures that take account of the well-being of ourselves and the planet. Kate Rayworth describes herself as agnostic towards growth acknowledging that there are poor countries out there who need it to ensure that their populations have enough to eat, places such as Malawi and Bangladesh. But all of our guests in this episode argue for the need for degrowth in affluent countries, such as the UK, the US and Europe. Timothée Parik is a French economist based at Lund University, Sweden, and is the author of Slow Down or Perish and The Political Economy of Degrowth. He also sports a superb moustache, unappreciated here, 
owing to the nature of the medium of a podcast. True to his economic beliefs, he hasn't just let it grow down to his knees, but after reaching the appropriate length for a Frenchman in his early 30s, he kept it in trim. No self-respecting Frenchman would want to get their oversized moustache trapped in a lift, would they? In fact, might a giant moustache trapped in an ascending lift be another good metaphor for our capitalist economy? No! Oh, okay. Behind the degrowth argument, there is um, a general message for economic cooperation to be like, if we change the way we socially frame production and consumption, we can enable ourselves to live better with less. I'll give you just one very concrete example of the raclette machine, you know, raclette being this uh, alpine melted cheese dish that we eat during the winter. So every household in France has like this cheese melter that you use usually one or twice a year. Imagine we managed somehow to organize a commons or a online reciprocity networks where neighbors can actually share one raclette machine. So we don't get poor. Actually, we might even get access to more because the people who didn't have enough money to buy one suddenly through this sharing common will get access to a raclette machine. And so here, that's the fundamental assumption behind degrowth is to say, if we share more, share access to goods and services, we can live better, uh, even though we downscale the size of the economy. So you need a culture, but you also need an infrastructure. And I, I, I'm giving you a couple of examples from where I live here in Sweden. I've been in Sweden for 10 years. And we share laundry machines. I know it sounds uh, very advanced forms of communism to people in the rest of the world, but here people have just communal laundry machines at the bottom of each buildings. Uh, so there's this very good quality laundry machine that you share with a bunch of other apartments. You have an online booking systems where you can you know, book hours whenever you want to use it. And that's completely normalized. But for this to function, you need to have the infrastructure. So you need to have, for example, the room. The, you need to have the online system with a set of rules where you can actually make sure that that system works because it's a common. And now I'm, I'm switching to another example I quite like. In, in Vienna, you know, these new co-housing projects where they build maybe 30 apartments in one block. And when they build it, they're asking themselves these questions. You're like, how do we include rooms that facilitate sharing? So for example, they'll be like, okay, we're, we're going to have a common bike room. We're going to have uh, maybe every apartment has its own kitchen, but we can have a shared kitchen room. And we can also have what they call like a library tool. So instead of each having our little screwdrivers in our apartments, when we move into that complex of 30 apartments, I can put all my tools into this library, this tool library. And when I need to fix something, I can actually go there. It can be a nice little convivial experience of other people teaching each other, it can actually become a nice thing where you meet your neighbors. And for me, this is a good definition of like collective wealth. And now I'm going to make one extra step, which I think is one of the sexiest arguments for degrowth. So let's imagine that we have created the structure and the culture that allow us to have this culture of sharing. It means we can allow ourselves to produce less cars, less cheese machine, less screwdrivers and everything because we manage to share more. So it means we can allow ourselves to work less. And here we have an interesting virtuous cycle. The more time we liberate, the more we can organize outside of the economy. So the more time I can actually spend teaching my neighbors how to fix bikes, uh, maybe we can create new uh, workshops we didn't create, maybe we create a local currency, maybe we create a shared garden, all these kind of stuff, these commons. We have more time to invest in them. And the more we invest in them, the less reliant we are on the old capitalist economy. And so the more we can afford to actually work less. And so here we have a nice virtuous cycle of degrowth where we can downscale, slowly downscale, while still maintaining our quality of life, and even increasing our quality of life. Because right now, I mean, we see the numbers about loneliness, about lack of trust, about individual rise of individualism with more time available and more of this community activities, which sociologists tell us is what makes us happy, human relations, not, you know, 
number of, of, of money points in your bank account. So for me, when I see this, I see an economy actually with way more human relations. And so I, here we, have, we reach logically this uh, result, which is surprising to many mainstream economists, that you can actually produce and consume less and be happier. So what about the paradigm shift we need to move from a growth economy to a well-being economy based around sustainability, regeneration, and growth for some countries, degrowth for others? There are some innovative economists out there who've presented possible solutions. One such is Kate Rayworth with her Donut Economics. The donut in question is the type favoured by Homer Simpson, rather than the whole squidgy ones you get in the UK with jam inside that squirt down your shirt front when you bite into them. The donut serves as a powerful visual metaphor for an economy which is not an ever-ascending line of growth, but is circular, more like an interdependent ecosystem. I'll let Kate explain. And if you think of humanity's use of Earth's resources, starting at a dot in the middle of that hole and radiating out, then it means the hole in the middle of the donut is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. In that hole, that's where people don't have the resources they need for health and education and housing, mobility and connection with others and dignity and community. So it's a place of deprivation where people have not been able to meet their human rights. We want to leave no one in the world in the hole in the middle of the donut, to get everybody out of the hole and that inner ring of the donut, we call it the social foundation, get everyone over that social foundation into the donut itself. But, and this is a very big but, at the same time as humanity, towards 10 billion of us collectively use Earth's resources to meet our essential needs and wants. We're harvesting wood, we're converting land into agricultural land, we're settling and creating cities, we're burning fossil fuels, we're drawing water, applying fertilizers. All of these uses of Earth's resources, we are putting pressure on the life supporting systems of our planetary home. And that's the outer crust of the donut. It's called the ecological ceiling beyond which we shouldn't go. And it's made up of these nine planetary boundaries that a group of around 30 Earth system scientists recognized in 2009. They said these are the life support systems that make this unique and delicately balanced living planet. They make it work and they keep her in balance. So it's like a stable climate. It's fertile soils. It's recharging fresh water in the lakes and rivers. It's abundant biodiversity. It's a, it's a protective ozone layer overhead. And so the goal of the donut, it's to meet the needs of all people. So let's put human and, and ecological values and integrity first. And that's why Donut Economics begins with the donut. And it says, imagine a world in which in this century we seek and we actually achieve to meet the needs of all people. And we do so within the life supporting systems of this planet. And I'd say that there are two big dynamics that we need to transform to get into the donut because we know we're out of it on both sides at the moment, right? Billions of people worldwide can't meet their most essential needs and we are way over multiple planetary boundaries. First, we've inherited a deeply degenerative economic system. The industrial systems we have are running down the living world, extracting again and again from Earth's sources like forests and from the oceans and from the soils. We need to go from degenerative to regenerative so that we're not using up Earth's resources and her generosities. We are restoring and rewilding and renewing. And that means changing the deep design of industry so we're not throwing things away. We are refurbishing and repairing and sharing. And that's where people go towards talking about a circular economy. So from degenerative to regenerative. But then the second dynamic is that we've inherited economies that are deeply divisive. They tend to drive opportunity and value into the hands of a few. And that's why we see the rise of a 1% in many nations and including globally. And a few billionaires are massively polluting and, and expending on extravagant luxuries. Economies that are far more distributive by design, that they share far more equitably the opportunity and value that is co-created by everyone. And that means enterprises that pay even beyond living wages they pay a profit share to the workers they pay well down global supply chains it means investing in health and education and public services and housing for all the economy we have today growth-based capitalism is not a well-being economy it's a money economy and what we want is an economy where every single thing you organize 
the way you organize a company, the kind of currency you're using, the way you're just saving your money, the way you're investing, the way you think about mobility, about agriculture, but all of these you do with the dual factors of priority of like, is that socially useful? Is that going to satisfy a need? Is that going to improve our well-being? And then you add an ecological imperative. Is doing this going to endanger the livelihood of people in other countries, people in this country's non-humans, future generations. Timothée explains that in a well-being economy, we'd need to give serious consideration to how we organised everything from agriculture and mobility to currency and companies, moving away from being driven solely by profit to consideration of their impact on society and the planet. So let's explore two specific examples that he mentions, currency and business. Sarah Osterholzer is co-founder of the Good Business Club, a group bringing businesses together to place to do things differently and to make a positive impact on the world. Sarah feels optimistic that businesses are changing, especially small companies, which make up 90% of all businesses in countries like the UK. Where businesses, I think, used to exist very much in their own little bubble, now are realising that they are having an impact on people and planet and they can choose whether that's a positive or a negative one. And they're taking that responsibility on. And I think we're gonna be living into a future where businesses are much more positively contributing to the whole of society as part of the ecosystem. I'll give some examples that are kind of local here to Brighton and kind of the UK as well. So in fact, there's one just up the road from where we are called The Bevy. And it's a community pub in Molescombe. And for people who don't know the area very well, it's probably one of the, the top five most underprivileged areas in the whole of the UK. And the Bevy was the only pub in, let's say, a couple of miles. So for one community, one pub. But unfortunately, just all the wrong sorts of people went there. And it got to the point where the, where the had to actually get closed down. Now, other people in the community were very aware that that was the only community hub they had. So the community came together, they raised funds, went, bought the pub, renovated, and now have been running for a good amount of years, maybe six to seven years. And you can go in there and buy a pint, but actually the beauty of what they do is everything around that. So they understand what the community needs, whether that's mums who want to get out the house and have play dates with with other local mums and and their kids whether it's gardening for people who are more elderly the first year they ran they made sure that no one was left alone for christmas and they actually had a van that went and picked up everyone brought them and had christmas lunch together they're actually having more of an impact in terms of what they've done as a community there than potentially an external initiative coming in to try and do that. How, how do they come to own it as a community? People chipped in? Yeah, exactly. So it's like community shares, basically. And the whole community actually owns it as an entity. And I hear it quite commonly. So another social enterprise, actually local, is an ethical supermarket called Hisby. Now, it was set up by uh, two sisters who particularly wanted to try and tackle the, the food industry. They wanted to, one, make good food accessible to more people. They wanted to focus on better supply chains for food, so more ethical, more local food produce being uh, sourced and shared locally rather than it being transported from everywhere else. And they also wanted to ensure that the work that they were creating was um, enabling suppliers to see more of that money rather than being kind of cat out and it being either the middleman or all the, or the organisations, the supermarkets getting all the money and also look after their people who work in the retail space a lot better. And I think that something that, um, like, Hisby was set up maybe 12 years ago, and it was a hard slog to get it up and running. Uh, things like Patagonia, Eden Project, like, these actually aren't new concepts, but there were people who were pioneering it before. Where I think there's a real shift now of, okay, we exist here, and there are people who work for us who are human beings, and we could give back, we can give more. Positive Money is a non-partisan research and campaign organisation and part of a growing collective force for economic system change. Its mission is to create monetary and financial systems aimed at achieving the goals of a well-being economy. They've also made some really brilliant videos for YouTube explaining what's wrong with our banking systems and how to fix them. The guy who does their voiceovers for free 
does a really good job. Nice one, my good friend. In one way or another, money affects almost everything that happens on the planet. If we want to deal with the big social, economic and environmental challenges that we're facing today, changing the nature of the money we use is where we have to start. David Barnes is an economist and head of research at Positive Money with a focus on the environment. We've heard a lot about cryptocurrencies over the past decade, so I began by asking David if cryptocurrencies might be a panacea for the future, decreasing the power of our reckless bankers, and how he sees money changing for the better. David, Dave, Dave, put, put a sock in it. Over to you, Dave. Is digital money a panacea for the future? I mean... Definitely not. At Post of Money, we have a very critical stance on, on cryptocurrencies, and we actually don't tend to call them currencies because they don't really have uh, the features of currency, of money. We tend to call them crypto assets, which is also what the regulators call them, because they are essentially just a speculative financial asset. They don't serve as a unit of account. They don't really serve as a medium of exchange. You know, although there's a lot of talk of them being the future of money, often the very people that are talking about these things as the future of money are people that are just trying to, to boost their value in, you know, denominated in conventional money so that they, they make more conventional money solution. It's also worth noting, especially in, the context of, of this podcast, that they are highly, highly environmentally harmful. You know, they have, Bitcoin has an enormous carbon footprint, um, larger than, than many countries. What we find much more interesting is the idea of a public digital money. It is the case that, you know, the crypto assets are likely to still gain in popularity and there's many different kinds of them. And we're, we are going to see big shifts in the monetary system. And we think that it's much more promising to have a public digital money option. So something like a central bank digital currency that could be administered the front end of it by, say, the post office. And this would give everybody access to public digital money. And that is something that could significantly decrease our dependence on commercial banks. Tic Tac, anyone? Oh, yeah, single use plastic. Yes, yeah, I suppose it is. Tic Tac, become a better business, change your packaging, or your days are numbered. Peanuts? Anyone? Our final guest in this episode is Inez Aponte, a storyteller, founder of Growing Good Lives an organization which seeks to reclaim economics as the art of living well, and a supporter of human scale development. Created by Chilean economist Manfred Max Neef in 1986, human scale development, like donor economics, is an economic model of well-being that challenges capitalism's hierarchical structures, from the so-called trickle-down effect, the power and dominance of big business, and the way decisions are made at the top and directed downwards. It is founded upon three pillars, fundamental human needs, increasing self-reliance, and a balanced interdependence of people with their environment. Taking wisdom from the complex relationships and ecosystems, rather than hierarchies and aggressive competition, human scale development is more circular and cooperative in structure, a bit like a donut, and just how we like it here at Newtopia HQ. Here's Inez. In ancient Greece, there was a distinction between what they called economia, which is where we get the word economics from, which is uh, from the words ekos, meaning home, and nomos, meaning the management of the home. Um, and this other thing, which they called krematistika, which comes from the Greek word krema, which means money. So they would have distinguished between the things we need to do in order to keep ourselves alive, to, for all to live well. Uh, and the things we do to actually grow uh, finance, to grow the money supply. So those two things are not the same thing. So you could grow GDP, which is what we're doing, and not necessarily have a good economy, because if you're not really meeting people's needs, then that's not a good economy. 
So I found that a really interesting distinction because right now the two have become conflated. We should really be talking about the chromatistics of the world. That's going quite well because we see that we have enormous amounts of money sloshing around in certain people's lives. But in terms of the economy, if we use the framework um, that I've been using, the human scale development framework, which um, judges the success of an economy based on nine fundamental needs being adequately met without harming ourselves, others, and the earth, then we see that we're actually not doing very well in many parts of the world, or in the parts of the world that we think we should be doing well, like, for example, in the wealthy parts of the world, we see enormous amounts of loneliness. In the, in the human scale the framework, that would mean a poverty of affection or a poverty of participation. We see um, people suffering from a, a lack of belonging or a sen- lack of a sense of identity. Those are all needs in the framework, which would point to a poverty. So in human scale development, you're not, you're not merely rich or poor, depending on how much money you have. You are wealthy if your needs are met and you are poor in many different areas. You can be poor if those needs are not met. And so the kind of alienation and the loneliness we're seeing are really, are really poverties in the human scale development framework, which means that if we start to think about that being our wealth, so those nine needs being met, um, and I'll just go maybe through the nine needs so we have some clarity about what they are. So we have the need for subsistence, uh, which is you know keeping your body alive, the need for protection, feeling safe, the need for participation, having a voice and being able to join in with others the need for freedom and autonomy, the need for affection, Um, idleness, so you need to have time to rest and relax, the need for identity, so having a sense of who you are and where you belong, a need for understanding, so understanding that is the understanding between people and also making sense of the world, and the need for creation. So uh, what, what you then do when you start to look at those, you think actually there are places where people may have less money, but actually are thriving in other areas, which is not the same as sort of um, romanticizing actual poverty in the sense of if you don't have enough water and food, then you really are poor. But a lot of us travel to parts of the world which are considered less wealthy because what we encounter there are a strong sense of community, so strong sense of participation, often a stronger sense of culture and identity than we have. So when you break it up like that, you can sort of think, okay, maybe there are ways of living we need to aspire to, to actually really meet our needs, rather than simply growing GDP and thinking that if we just keep growing GDP, the rest will fix itself. So one of the things that attracted me to the framework was because It is a framework that focuses on how communities themselves perceive their needs being met. So you might have a community like I I live in Dartington, where our subsistence needs are very well met, but our needs for participation and affection identity may be quite poor. So when a community comes together, identifies that, there's a strength of a community thinking, okay, how are we then going to change this and this isn't only because it's it's not purely grassroots but it's saying that actually the change must happen from the grassroots it's a lot more work to communicate with communities and people on the ground and that slow process of getting people on board but i think that's the only way we're going to get lasting change even the wealthy people i talk to are like well I'm feeling quite alienated. I feel quite lonely. I'm working too many hours. I hardly see my family. Over and over and over again, the same thing. Because the framework is an economic framework, but it talks about affection, for example, it really opens people's eyes to the fact that no economic system is working if you're miserable. And I think that's the kind of thing that needs to, the switch needs to be switched over in people's minds about what an economy actually is meant to do. And quite often people just think about economics as the, it's the jobs, it's the imports, it's the exports, it's GDP. And they don't think, no, it's about how we live well within the limits of, you know, the planet that we inhabit. That's really, it's very, very simple. Donut economics talks about needs, but it doesn't go into the sort of nitty gritty about the needs, which I think is what human scale development does. This is what's a little bit tricky to wrap your head around with human scale development. In human scale development, food is not a need. Food is a satisfier. It's a satisfier 
primarily um, for the need for subsistence. So you immediately think, oh yeah, I need to eat so I can stay alive. But when you separate the need of subsistence from the satisfier of food, you start to see that there's many different ways of eating. You know, you can go and get a McDonald's on your own and watch television, which might be exactly what you need on a very kind of, at the end of a busy week, nothing wrong with that. But that has a different quality from sitting down with a meal that you've cooked yourself with your family. That's a different quality of satisfier. And that's what's powerful for me about human scale development. You don't talk about the satisfiers, you talk about the needs. And then you start to think, oh, okay, how does Western civilization approach these needs? And where could we do better? So the middle of the donut, I'd call it. <laughs> yeah. So far, we've explored two complementary alternative economic models to replace capitalism based on human and planetary well-being. We've looked at a new dashboard of measurements to replace GDP that also account for well-being. We've had ideas for transforming financial systems and examples of how small businesses are changing for the better. An inevitable question amongst all of this, for any listeners who aren't billionaires, is that what can we as individuals do to make a difference? For the Eden Project's Tim Smith, it's all about muscular localism, or in other words, ground-level, community-led people power. Something, again, that all of our guests seem to agree on. I believe we need to make grassroots actually really healthy tree roots. But if you start from a principle, a big principle, we believe in muscular localism, we can do it for medicine, for health, for, for, for food. I think the future is going to get to a point where capital is understood, collaboration becomes part of capitalism, the old cooperative movement and whatever will make a huge uh, comeback. And you know where you can look for this? You go to the Basque country of Spain, where you will find the largest cooperative on earth, set up in 1957. And it's one of the great capitalist secrets that no one talks about. They turn over 2.9 billion a year. They have over a hundred companies. They have their own hospital, their own university, their own cobblers, bakers, candlestick makers. They have everything. And they came out of the ruins of Guernica. It was set up by a Catholic priest. And it was a cooperative that saw people pooling what few resources they had in a place that had been actually scorched because Franco hated the Basques. He saw them as traitors to his vision of, of, of Spain. Mondragon, it's called the greatest cooperative on earth. And they began with a philosophy, which was that the, the boss of the organization could not earn more than three times what uh, the most underpaid member of the team was paid. That saw two things happen. It saw that the lower paid started to get paid a lot more because the boss wanted to earn a lot. And that was good. Then when a new cooperative was set up to be financed by the first cooperative, the new cooperative always had to have an officer and a board member of the first cooperative so that the second co company had the experience of running a company to guarantee the success of the second. Can we generate our own electricity? Can we insulate our homes and install solar panels together with our neighbours? Can houses band together and say, let's all, let's all do this at the same time? It should be a lot easier than it is at the moment. There's an amazing organisation called Civic Square in Birmingham who are trialing that at a micro level in one street, saying, how could we develop this as a, a hub in this street? What could we learn from doing a, a street level retrofit, an insulation of the houses and bringing in solar panels so that this could be replicated far more easily across the nation and in other countries? Got to make this easier for people to do. But also not only how we heat our homes, how we, you know, where, where do you save your money? Which bank do you give the privilege of holding and investing your savings? And what are they doing with it? So I think it's a beautiful opportunity to really take our homes as a as a the household, not the planetary household, but the literal microcosm household and celebrate letting go of old patterns and celebrate joining new ones. It's a mind shift. And we've had 100 years of consumer propaganda telling us we need to own things. And now you need to own a newer, better, faster one. So that's gone in deep. I think of um, Edward Bernays the man who invented propaganda, he was the, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, right? He was very smart. He took his uncle's psychotherapy and turned it into retail therapy and 
and got us addicted to buying stuff. I wish she was still here. I'd say, well done, Edward. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Would you now please join the other team? Could you now please help unravel all that tight raveling you've done of sense of self and purchase? We need to unravel that. For me, the biggest part of, of all of this is that we need to find solidarity. We need to be um, seeing ourselves less as individuals with a problem and think, oh, this is actually a kind of problem we're all sharing. So um, I'll, I'll just give you an example of, of my own life. When my son was little, I was a single parent and I'd be on my own with my child. And I remember thinking next door, next to me in this sort of like this set of buildings, just next door, there may be another single parent and maybe another one a bit further along. But if we don't know each other and we're not communicating, then how can we, rather than me thinking, oh, this is me as an individual having a problem, it's actually, no, we have obviously a collective problem that we're trying to do too much on our own. Even as simple things like cooking a meal, they could be shared. So I think the most important thing we can do is actually turn to our neighbors and say, you know, ask for help, offer help, and start building this solita solidarity from the bot bottom up in whatever way we can. Because as soon as we start to work together and address some of our kind of the most basic issues together, let's say, you know, I only have to cook one meal a week, that frees up four other of, of the working week, four other days in which I have more time for other things. And right now, because we've individualized our, our society so much, we're all individually dealing with collective problems. So I would say the first thing is, is to try and make space by sharing the load with others as much as you can. If, if we have a little bit of space to give, give it to your neighbors, give it to your community, because um, those are the people with which you can start to build something new. So not childcare is very expensive as much cities. It has been, and not many parents are just hostage of, they have to pay enormous fees for their kids to go to childcare. How do we collectively organize an alternative uh, system of provision? Here, one example could be the self-run uh, childcare commons. You know, some parents are just collectively coming together and be, you know what? We're maybe 50, 60 parents we're going to create a structure where together we're going to pull up some money so that we can have a place and so we can pay the wage for the people working there. And then maybe also we pay in kind when we're going to pay with money so you can cooperate in giving a few hours every week. And so you have this self-run childcare commons, which is a not-for-profit structure because the goal here is childcare. The, the goal is not to make money out of it. The goal is to run that thing the cheapest way possible and with the highest quality, which is the opposite mentality that you have in a for-profit center where actually they try to you know, cut cost and maximize profit. There is, however, and perhaps inevitably, a sting in the tail with all of this. Here's David Barnes again from Positive Money, tempering our utopian dreams. More collectivism and using fewer washing machines, for example, you could, you could say this is good for everyone. However, the capitalist system survives and thrives on sales. And so if you lower economic activity within a capitalist system and you find yourself in a situation where the economy is not growing, um, but we have not transformed the system more deeply, that will very likely and has already to some extent led to various crises, financial crises, social crises, economic crises. Like all of the problems with the financial system uh, fundamentally comes down to power and power relations. And I think we're not going to be able to fix this system unless we reclaim power over our monetary and financial system and over our democracy uh, more, more generally. So, um, and that's something that more recently at Positive Money we've been working on because I think we're realizing that a lot of the, a lot of the policies that we're putting forward, while, you know, they're very well researched and well thought through, they, many of them, you know, aren't going to get implemented while we have a system 
in which large financial institutions and other corporations have essentially captured the policy process. And so we produced um, a report on this last year called The Power of Big Finance, looking at all of the ties between policymakers and financial institutions. And it was really quite shocking. Uh, I mean, we were expecting some of it, but the extent of the entanglement is is really astounding. So I'm actually tempted to lean towards um, breaking that that relationship between okay. uh, private institutions and and policymakers. I I think we're we're still pretty stuck. Um, and yeah, I think this idea of moving away from GDP as being the primary goal of the economy, that's something that has not really reached policymakers uh, very widely. All we hear politicians talking about often is still this this idea of growth, growth, growth. We need more and more growth. It's quite clear that although governments have been committing to, in some cases, relatively ambitious environmental goals, um, policy is nowhere near aligned uh, with those goals. So what does David think are the most important things that need to change first? Public ownership of the infrastructure and services that are necessary to fulfill basic human needs. To me, that's just so that's essential. And I think it's it's absurd that we don't have that water, uh, energy, of course, healthcare, of course, education, social care. These are this is the, the foundational economy. These are the things that we absolutely need to survive and to live dignified lives. In my view, these should be uh, publicly owned and publicly provided services and universally accessible. So we need our services to be publicly owned and government intervention on a grand scale. Yet the close ties between big business and politics require radical new governments to make any lasting changes. Can we expect that anytime soon? Tim Smith's opinion of governments here is one that I suspect many share. I think governments are predominantly craven. Their members wish to please the public so that they are elected. It means that if they see a way to get more elected, they will go there and they will then measure the timescale in which they can deliver it or not to find out whether that particular initiative is worth investing in, whether the results will be something they can boast about before the next election. If they can't, generally, they won't support it. If you really wanted to cure an enormous amount you'd get all the political parties to agree that certain things are just in the national interest and should not be political footballs, like health and education. They would be the two real big ones. So do we end on a sobering note that our economy desperately needs to change for the sake of us and the planet? But the systems involved are run by powerful companies and individuals with a vested interest in keeping the status quo to either maximize profits or to avoid losing elections? Let's not forget, the pandemic showed that globally, governments are capable of making huge changes in the face of a crisis. The pandemic also showed just how much goodwill, cooperation and sharing we're all capable of. After lockdown, I set up Biscuit Club with a bunch of freelancer friends, just like Inez and Timothée's ideas about rethinking childcare, washing machines and cheese heating devices. With Biscuit Club, we take it in turns to use each other's houses for hot desking, and we usually binge on biscuits in the process. It's all coordinated through a WhatsApp group. It's fun, social, free, and saves on heating. It also doesn't contribute anything to GDP, but is great for our well-being. David Barnes is right to remind us that as things stand, such enterprises aren't helping a struggling economy, but many of us want to embrace a more sharing approach to economics, and as Kate Rayworth puts it, run ahead of the curve. So we'll finish with some words of wisdom from Kate and, I hope, take inspiration from all of our guests in this episode and end with one individual who's really making a difference by preaching the good word of degrowth and warning of the shipoko... of the shipoko... God, yeah. And warning of the shipoko... shipoko... and warning of the shopocalypse right across America. And I think it's really important 
to recognize that people want to make a change in their life, even though we know that the solutions, the big solutions we need are going to be systemic and structural. And that's when, why we need policy change and industrial change. And we should never expect that the solution has to be driven by the individual. You have to do the right thing. We need structural solutions. And yet people want to run ahead of that curve and show the will and the interest for a different kind of living. Arrested over 50 times for exercising the First Amendment, Reverend Billy and the Church of Stop Shopping Choir urge consumers to abandon the products of large corporations and mass media and build a more local, compassionate economy. Converting from consumer confidence to community confidence. Amen. It's not too late to save your soul, children. We've all accepted that shopping is the basis of our life. Each person here will be suffering thousands of advertising events every day. Change, hallelujah. To the next transnational store. We call for people to evolve a local and more compassionate economy. Put your credit cards away, children. You don't have to shop. It's the shapocalypse. Ship, ship, ship of the shipocop of the shipocop. Adventures in Utopia was produced and presented by me, David Bramwell, with music from Oddfellows Casino. For more info, go to drbramwell.com or contact me on Twitter at Dr. Bramwell. Huge thanks to all of my guests in this episode and for the support of Hawkwood College. The idea of Newtopia was established by John and Yoko in 1973 as a place with no boundaries and whose international anthem is silence. Gratitude and support to our friends at Journey to Newtopia for their role in our provenance. This podcast is made possible by the generous sponsorship of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. Wait, Druids you say? Aren't they all just about wearing white robes, hanging around Stonehenge and listening to the levellers? No. Isn't there human sacrifice? No, that was propaganda put about by Julius Caesar. But you have to have a beard and carry a staff, right? No. Are they passionate environmentalists with a love of storytelling and art? herbalism, divination, and with an added spiritual dimension and ritual practices that connect with the seasons, the elements, and nature. Yeah, that's what druids are. Do they drink mead? Actually, yeah, they do drink quite a lot of mead. Find out more about what the Order does and offers on their website at druidry.org.